I'm O'Ree Weller, and I'm a retired naval officer and a retired engineer. And I'm looking back on 50 years, back to 1941, when I was a seaman second class, an enlisted man in the Pacific Fleet, and my ship was the mighty USS Arizona, the most prestigious ship in the United States Navy. Saturday, December the 6th, I, we had captain's inspection that morning, and fortunately my, my spaces were cleaned. I was a striker in the navigator's office for yeoman, which was a Navy term for ship's clerk. And I passed the inspection, caught the Loon Liberty boat, and went over to do my Christmas shopping. Came back at one o'clock in the morning. All, all uh, Navy men below the grade of petty officer first class had to be back aboard at one o'clock. Everybody else, the first class chiefs, officers, could stay overnight, have overnight liberty. But being a seaman second class, I had to come back aboard, and, and I was. Next morning, I got up had breakfast in the cruise spaces, and since I had been ashore on Saturday, the mail had arrived, and so I went up to the navigator's office, which was on the boat deck, where they stored all of the ship's boats while the uh, Arizona was at sea, to read the mail, and was there when I heard the air raid alarm go off. What the devil, air raid alarm? I stepped out onto the boat deck and looked aft over our fantail, our stern, and over the Nevada came a Japanese plane, you could tell it was Japanese, had a great big red meatball on the side of the fuselage. And at that time, General Quarters, which is the battle station, started sounding. And I went back into the, to the navigator's office and closed all the battle ports and headed back to the main mast, which is the aftermost mast of the two aboard ship, and went up the port ladder, which was on the port leg of the mast, and I got about halfway up to the searchlight platform when the bombs really started plowing into us. A repair ship, the Vestal, was moored alongside, and it drew less water than we did, so torpedoes went underneath the Vestal and slammed into us. Bombs hit us on the quarter deck, and I went on up, finally got up into secondary battery control, which is the gun control station for the secondary battery of the ship put my headphones on, and was there when it seemed like an earthquake. He had all hell broke loose. That main mast shook, vibrated, and what had happened is that they dropped a bomb forward of the uh, forward part of the ship that went down and exploded into black powder magazines, and that exploded the main magazines, and that just blew the bottom out of the ship. And we sunk right to the bottom. We had we normally drew 30 feet of water, and the har harbor was 45 feet deep. So we sank 15 feet into the mud. And when we came to rest, the uh, ship was burning from the base of the main mast forward. Uh, fuel oil had ruptured out of the fuel tanks. It was a fire. Uh, I had tried to contact people on my telephone circuit and was not successful. There were about 10 Marines up there who did the the work on the uh, main battery control director and uh, we decided that since we couldn't do anything the guns that they had control of were obviously now out of operation because they were all down in the middle of that flaming inferno so we went down the mast and I got down to the boat deck and all the ladders had been blown away and I went, tried to go down in one compartment and it was burning so I had jumped from the boat deck to the quarter deck which is about 20 feet and I hit and rolled and had absorbed the shock of the, of the jump. Then about that time we were getting strafed, so we went under the overhang of the number three turret, and you could see in the deck just uh, stitching across the teakwood decks where the, where the bullets were going. We came out, we tried to fight the fire. We had no water pressure. The uh, fire extinguishers, CO2 fire extinguishers were empty. Uh, no power, no nothing, so it was decided to abandon ship, and so they gave the word, and I uh, took my shoes and socks off, my hat, 
lay them underneath a convenient uh, ventilator and drove over the side into the through the fuel oil which about 30 40 feet up toward the bow was burning and I swam through that fuel oil and beneath it toward the officers club dock which was about a hundred yards away and I came up and uh, I was still quite a ways away but the fuel oil was burning much closer to me this time so I went down again started swimming and the second time I came up why motor launch from the hospital ship Solus uh, came saw spotted me and came in and stuck out a boat hook and grabbed me aboard and and uh, they had wounded and burned that they had picked up from the Arizona and took them over to the to the hospital ship Solus I stayed with the with the motor launch because other than having oil all over me I wasn't hurt or burned at all so I stayed with them and and helped them go around searching picking up other sailors from the water we headed for one sailor and the fuel oil was burning and the flames beat the boat beat us and so we lost him we went over to the West Virginia and it was burning and it was on the bottom and we hauled off a bunch of sailors from that and uh, Finally, the coxswain decided he would take all these sailors that he had, I guess it must have been 35 or so in the, in the boat, take us over to Magazine Island, which was uh, where all the ammunition stores were kept there in Pearl Harbor, and dropped us off. And he dropped me off, and a gunner's mate came and took his, his uh, undershirt off, his skivvy shirt, gave that to me to wipe my eyes and my face and my mouth with. I was completely covered with fuel oil. Then they had me strip off all of the, the uh, my clothes that I had on, which was tropical uniform, white shorts, which are now nothing but oil. And they gave me a pair of dungarees to put on. And I since couldn't find any shoes, so I wrapped my feet in rags. And that's how I stayed the rest of the day. And finally I got to, uh, they had to turn me over to uh, the mine school people, and I stayed with the mine school people that night. And then the next day, I went over to the receiving station, and uh, by that time they had had emergency personnel desks set up and uh, painted above each desk was the name of a ship, USS Tennessee, West Virginia, Arizona. So I went over to the Arizona desk and identified myself, and they had me on the known dead list. So I told them that no, I reports of my death are greatly overrated. Of course, I didn't say that. I said, nope, I'm alive. So they let me fill out a card, which my folks didn't get until the late February, that said that I was okay. So at 7.55, here they came. And if we'd, have had, if we'd have had as much as an hour's notice, the final message uh, out, of, out of Washington to the, to the uh, fleet and army commanders was sent by commercial radio and was hand-delivered on a kid on a bicycle on the afternoon, five hours after the Japanese had departed. But that was Pearl Harbor, and over the 50 years that's passed, I have come to some definite conclusions as to the reason for Pearl Harbor. Uh, but Roosevelt had maneuvered uh, the country and it maneuvered Japan. Uh, he, his strategy, as I see it now, is to get Japan to attack us because Japan, Italy, and Germany had a tripartite pact, the Axis Pact. And if one, uh, if Japanese attacked us, that would give Roosevelt the reason to go into Europe and, and fight alongside Britain and uh, Hitler. Fifty years have gone by, and I still believe that the day of infamy was December the 6th in Washington, not December the 7th.